Okay, welcome everybody. So, yeah, it's about my fifth or sixth time here. And uh, it's kind of an honor to be asked to like, present the keynote address. Um, and a, we arranged last year that we've been looking at um, how people were presenting, both here and many other academic conferences. <clears throat> and we felt that it might be interesting just to see if we can do something about the way that people tell the story. And so that's what I'm going to be doing. I'm videoing it, and I will, we will get it posted up on YouTube, and then there'll be a link uh, up on the conference website in due time. So, And I'll also post up a PDF of these slides <coughs> fairly soon after uh, the presentation. I might add a few um, words in the notes section so that you've got a little bit more, because I'm giving a very, very stripped down sort of presentation. And it might surprise many people just how little in the way of words you can actually get away with and yet tell your amazing story. Because each one of you in here, with your presentation, your paper, and each one of you has something really interesting to tell us. But here we are at a multidisciplinary conference, and we don't all know each other's subject terribly well. So we've got to think, how do we tell our story to engage with each one of you? Maybe some of you will see some examples. I'm going to give a couple of little examples of what I think are catastrophically bad ways of giving a presentation. We see them at academic conferences. We also see them in some of our colleagues' lectures. And we cringe when we see an example of first first example I'm giving you. So in terms of what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you a couple of examples of things that we've seen here and elsewhere over the last year or two, and then I'm going to show you something that's not necessarily the best way of doing it, but is perhaps quite a lot better way of presenting up on here in a way that allows you to keep the audience really well engaged. So I want to sort of cover two or three little topics here to start with. Just as a kind of an introduction of context. Now I'm rather fortunate because I'm not chased by my seniors to go get lots and lots and lots of seriously high staff rating papers out there uh, in journals and in academic conference. My role is to kind of be an ambassador for the School of Computing and Maths at the University of Derby on, in the area of big data analytics and governance. And so I get to quite a few, I get invited to quite a few business conferences. <clears throat> and the thing that horrifies me in many ways is comparing the quality of the presentations, the storytelling, that I see and listen to in the business conferences compared to what I see in academic conferences and in some of my colleagues and our colleagues uh, lectures at university. Remember, as academics, as professors, our role <coughs> is to communicate, to enthuse our students. We're not there just to tip vast numbers of facts into their heads. We're there, as Plutarch said, not to fill leaky buckets with knowledge and facts and figures and theories and all the other things that, as academics and content experts and domain experts, we feel our students need to learn. Plutarch said, no, that's not the case. Education is about lighting the fires of enthusiasm. Getting all of those students we're now seeing who actually don't really want to be at university with us very much. They don't really want to engage very much. And we've got to find a way of turning it around and making them really enthusiastic to research and to learn and find out what's really happening in the world. And it bothers me when I see a lot of academic presentations at academic conferences, IEEE and so on, who are really not helping themselves communicate. 
And so I want to look here, and Joe asked me to look at, is there a way that I can help some of you who may feel, oh dear, I'm very nervous and I'm not quite sure what I've got to do, and by the way, I've got so much in my head to tell everybody. Let's find a way. Just looking at what we do. And find a way to tell the story. Now, what's interesting about that little phrase, tell the story, is I've not heard it until the last year. And then suddenly, it is in every business conference you go to, whether it's in, in former conferences in the telecoms industry, uh, conferences in the retail sector where I was in um, Barcelona about three weeks ago, two weeks ago. The phrase, tell the story, has become incredibly important in business to business people. Because they have been complaining for the last 10 years, 15 years, that we academics do not deliver graduates who can communicate, who are creative, who can collaborate. And they certainly can't tell a story. We produce geeks, effectively, whether we're in computing or in almost any other subject. They are pe we deliver people, students, graduates, who are technically experts. They know their subject, but they can't communicate about it. And so this phrase, telling the story, is applied not only to our graduates, but also to their own peers, their own colleagues in the business. They say, our colleagues can't tell stories any longer. <coughs> now, one of the lovely things about the American and, I think, the Canadian uh, academic system is you do still, certainly in America, and, I've, and from a colleague in Canada, you still do the liberal arts pretty much as a sort of option, well, or as a minor side, for all students. So things like speaking, like rhetoric and so on, kind of potentially gets included. But in the UK, nothing like that happens. It's not happened for years and years and years. So we don't have people telling the story. So that's really what I want to have a little look at today. I'll give you a couple of examples of good and also bad, and maybe a little bit better. A few thoughts about developing your story and planning out your presentation, and then a little bit about how we go about thinking about telling that story that is so important to us. Whether we're PhD students, and this is our first presentation, or whether we are long in the tooth academics, we've been doing things for years, it doesn't hurt to think back over our own practice. And I was down in um, Vegas uh, about four weeks ago at the SAS Global Forum, and the keynote address for the academic section on the first night was all about how to do and present scientific presentations. Example number one, and I'm sure we've all seen, sorry, too far. We've all seen a slide like that, or even worse. That's actually not bad. It's 24 point text on there. So it's it's quite decent size. I've seen presentations with 20 point text, so you've got twice as much nearly. And then someone stands back to the audience like this and says, learning analytics can be of great value in helping academics to evaluate the impact of the different pedagogic choices. It should therefore be considered a standard part of academic continuous professional development practice and to aid and aid to reflection the guidance. Sorry, I'm not going to go on, you're all sleeping already. We've had one, several of those here over the last couple of years. And it's a complete monotone. And everybody in the audience goes to sleep. How many of our colleagues produce slides as densely packed for their lectures? 50 slides, all of that, and then they read it and wonder why their students kind of vanish. They sort of go to the first lecture in the series and then a few weeks later there's nobody there. Now that is actually the first paragraph, couple of paragraphs of a chapter that I wrote for this published in an uh, edited book on learning and academic analytics. Can we do better than that? Yes. All you need to set, have on your slide is that. 
And then <clears throat> you present it and tell the story in the following way. That chapter, I'll talk about it as a chapter. The chapter is all about what we can do with learning analytics. Learning analytics is using analytical tools like statistics to look at the data that we all generate completely automatically as part of the way that we mark our students' assignments and, and, and the work they hand in. And almost all of us put that straight into a little spreadsheet. If it's a portfolio, we do a few sort of weighted numbers, so they build up the components to the total value. And then we can start looking at the grade average, and we can look at the standard deviation. We can know so how wide the spread is. We can also look at things like, in Britain, it's very, very important at the moment to look at the difference in grade average between our white UK students and our black and minority ethnic and international students. Because in Britain, broadly speaking, the grade average between those two groups is something between 15 and 20 percent. And I believe it's similar pretty much across um, sort of North America as well. And so you can use these statistics or these numbers and comparisons, learning analytics, to find out what's actually going on. And you can then change your pedagogic approaches and use this approach to find out whether you're being successful. Is that gap reducing? Maybe the male-female uh, split. What's happening there? Is there a different ability, ability ranges? Is there no, loads and loads of things you can do? And then the chapter goes on to explain what I've been doing over the last three years or four years in the ways that have reduced that gap from, as I say, 15-20% is the average across most of the university sector, up to 5% in some. And I've managed to reduce it to between 0 and 5%. Occasionally, the black and minority ethics get better than the whites. And then... The chapter goes on to explain some of the interesting consequences of all the various aspects that have gone into this uh, journey that I've taken over three years. And it leads to interesting consequences that the students are better engaged, they deliver far better work, the grade average, not only the gap narrows, but the grade average moves up in very, very interesting ways. And my effort, the amount of work I put into developing lectures year on year, has reduced to almost zero because I don't have anything on my slides which is time dependent. I can use my slides on the subject for, 20, for 10 or 15 years without having to change them at all. I just have to keep up with the developments in my subject. So I can talk against the slides to what's happening today. I don't have to recreate the slides just before the lecture to add in what I heard yesterday that's going on that's really fascinating. Now, how does that compare with four lines compared with what would have been five pages of that 24-point text? It's a scary thing to do first time you do it. But we all know our subject, don't we? Why do we have to have everything up there? Now this one was triggered by a little presentation we saw last year, in fact we saw several like this. All of the data in the statistics, yeah, funny backgrounds, bad contrast is deliberately there as it happens, and also all of these statistics. And you then you have that up there, the temptation is to go through sort of column by column what the mean and standard deviation you know, and all of that lot and then across here, and what the difference in that and that is, and what the difference in that mean and that seal mean, and you know, you could be doing that for 10 minutes. And we've all gone to sleep again. It doesn't tell us anything useful. Now, if you're a PhD student or a researcher, and yet, you know, you do need to have that data available in that form. But it tells you all sorts of interesting things about your numbers and about your populations that are there and so on. You need to know it when you are defending your thesis, when you are defending your work, to justify, yeah, this is the right set of statistics that I've done, and it proves that what I've done is correct. 
But you don't have to present it at a conference like this. You can get rid of all of those. You just don't need them. What you need is that. Because it's so much easier to explain that showing the difference between the means of the two populations, black minority ethics in the V, the W, the white UK. It shows that there's a 6% in this particular block uh, of a difference between the two groups. Six percentage points, that's less than the grade. That is average, that's data over about five or six years. And so it includes my work before I change my approach and what I'm doing now that shows that even though I have changed and now narrowed the gap even further, I must have been doing something quite different and quite interesting before I developed my new approach. So you can use a, little, a couple of wavy lines like that as a background for talking about the story. The thing that's important as a communicator. So, I'm going to provide a few thoughts, a few questions. Because one of the things I do is I never, if I can avoid it, teach an answer. If I teach an answer, the people listening stop learning because they know that's the answer. I always ask every single student when I first see them, whether it's first or second year, final year, or masters, do you expect me to teach you answers or questions? And there's normally a stunned, boggled silence. You're teaching me answers? I want, I want the question. I want the answers, sorry. I really want answers, don't I? That's what I come to university for. That's what I pay my fees for. And that opens up an interesting discussion about what the role of education is. And the fact that the questions, whether we look at literature, whether we look at STEM, science, technology, engineering, and maths, and so on, chemistry, whatever, almost all of the fundamental and important questions have not changed fundamentally in the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years. I've worked in the field of computing for the best part of 40 years now, 45 years. And the questions of the systems analyst or the computer scientist that we asked back in the 1960s and 1970s are fundamentally the same questions as we ask today. <coughs> Nothing has changed in terms of the question. The technology's changed, the answers change, and in fact, the answers change in Ryerson compared with UT, University of Toronto, or University of Derby, or University of Burundi, or wherever. So we need to teach our students the questions. So I'm going to pose a few questions to you. This is part of, you can think of it as part of your reflective personal development, just to check that what you're doing is okay, or is there something I can I think more deeply, I can improve a little bit better, become more and more effective as a community. Now, when we're giving a talk, a presentation, it doesn't really matter where, or even if we're thinking about writing a paper for a conference, or anything else, these are effectively the <coughs> four most important questions. And you'll notice the difference between the word want and the word need. Our heads are full of an amazing amount of information about what we're writing about. Well, that's us. Unfortunately, some of our undergraduates seem to have a very empty head. You know, you, they come to you for a dissertation supervision, and they've been working on it for the last few weeks, and then they say, oh, Richard, sorry, I've forgotten my memory stick. Yes, and the point of that, that is, well, I was going to show you my work. Right. Well, let's talk about it. Uh, and you've all had this, I'm sure. Without their little pe their thing up on the screen to talk about, there is nothing. Where is it? It's in here, surely. Mm. What's going wrong? What's going on? So, what do I want to say? I've got so much to say about everything. But what do I 
need to say? What's the most important thing that I've got to convey over the next 5, 10, 20 minutes? So you think about what I want and then crunch it down. So those things are absolutely critical. As part of that filtering, you need to think about the why. Why do I want to say that? Right, it's a bit like when you're teaching your students <coughs> to think about their writing, their critical analysis. The fact that you need to challenge every single sentence, almost every single word, with, so what? What does that phrase, that sentence, or even that word contribute? Can I get rid of it? Can I make it more concise? Do I need to have three case study examples, or can I crunch it down just to one, so fit it in the time, the word count, the word limit, the slide limit? So it's again that what do I want, the lot, to what do I need, the little bit. You then need to think about who. Who is your audience? Because that has an enormous impact. How much do they know about the subject? How familiar are they? Now, are they going to be sympathetic? What sort of people are they? Well, you've got to think about your audience. And you can still keep the same construct there. You might not actually really want to not think of it in terms of want and need, but you know, by posing the why question and the who question, and then the final one, the how, you can kind of get a feel for what you need to plan in order to be able to get that message across powerfully and concisely and very, very convincingly. We are there to present that story. All of you have got fabulous stories that you brought here. And you want to be able to engage us, really enthuse us, enthuse us to listen and pick up that one or two beautiful nuggets that you know you want us to remember. We should be able to go away from here on Friday evening thinking, wow, I've learned something new about so many subjects outside of us, my own sphere. The point about coming here is they're generalists. It allows us to learn a little bit about biomechanics, a little bit about mechanical engineering, a little bit about literature placed in all sorts of parts of the world, India, Nigeria, Canada, USA. England, and so on. You've got so much to share with us all. But if you present it as that first one, this is what I'm talking about today, and I will, we're not going to remember. You will have wasted your time in one sense. You will have probably listened to lots, you have got to meet a lot of interesting people, been out to Niagara, see the local part of uh, Ontario State. But you won't <coughs> have been able to leave that message in other people's heads. So just to expand a little tiny bit on that, a little bit more about the what do I want or need to say. What we're trying to get there is the overall outline plan of the whole of that presentation. But plan it out carefully, folks. There is a difference between a presentation you're probably going to give here, which is to inform your colleagues about something really cool, really beautiful. And then, if you're giving a more of a businessy presentation or you're presenting your dis uh, PhD uh, thesis, you may be wanting to actually turn it a little bit more from the informing side to, I'm going to persuade you that I have got the right approach and this is the right answer. So there is a difference between those two types of presentation, the informing one and the persuading one. And I guess today, this is persuading that you guys can do even better than you ever thought. You're probably, many of you, very good. But can <coughs> you develop to be even more stunning? So use these questions as checklists to help you refine and improve your approach. 
because remember, you're trying to put a pretty minimalist set of slides up there because you don't want people looking at them all the time and having this bizarre dissonance between the words they're reading and the words they're hearing. So think about the questions about the want and need to say. Questions around about why. And when we, I mean, as academics, we probably all supervise undergraduates or graduates and PhD students about with different projects. And sometimes we're a little bit careless and say, hey guys, what are your aims and objectives for your research? And we kind of forget that, and, or we kind of put the, an S, a plural, on both aims and objectives. You can't have multiple aims, you've got to have a single aim. If you've got two, more than one aim, you're going to get confused. You can have several objectives because they come one after the other typically in a project and in your presentations here. But you must have a single aim that provides that strategic direction that you're trying to go with what you're doing. And then you need the whys and so on behind that. It's kind of iterative as you go through these and work out what you're really, really trying to do. What is the minimum you've got to put into here, and what is the minimum you've got to use as you stand in front of your audience? And remember, you really don't want to be using the keyboard there to slip through your slides every 30 seconds. You really can't do that. And the reason you've done that is because you've got 50 or 100 slides for a one hour or two hour session and you've got 50, 200, maybe 100, 150 words on each slide. You've got to keep going through like that. No. Those slides are the backdrop. Some people will say, and this person I was at, at the SAS Global Forums, actually you don't need any words at all. You should be using pictures. Kind of a bit hard work at times to find enough pictures which are copyright free to be able to illustrate what you want to do. Um, so that's why I've not done that. Um, because also, I want to provide a little bit of background that helps you to remember what I was saying. And as I said, I'll publish all of these with more of the text in the notes section underneath. Because remember, again, as we give presentations both here and at teaching, Sometimes we put too much in the words just because this is going to be the only record that the students have got. <laughs> so don't print out that version, fill up the notes section and produce a PDF of the slide and the notes. And video them as well, folks. If you go onto the YouTube channel that you can find, if you just say Richard Self Derby in YouTube search, you will find most of my uh, playlists for the uh, different lecture series I've given over the last couple of years or so. They're all there. First year undergraduate, second year undergraduate, third year, and masters, sometimes. So that gives another record. And I had some feedback from students about the value of those videos that I just post up on my YouTube channel. I don't have to put it onto the university uh, special um, closed blackboard environment. I just put it out there. I don't have anything to hide. Anybody around the world is Welcome to pick them up and use them for their students as well, if they think they're good enough. <coughs> Why not build up our sort of commons for everybody to use our materials? But a slide should be, uh, provide you and the audience with a little framework for the next two to five minutes. And we should have enough in our heads to be able to talk about it. How often have you gone into a lecture, an hour's lecture, with nothing? and just stood there and engaged the students for 50 minutes, say, without a single note, without a single slide. If you haven't done that, can I challenge you to do something like that next year? To prove to yourself that you do have enough knowledge of your field. It's a little bit scary, the first time you do it, perhaps. But it's different. And you can maintain that eye contact with your students all the time. 
a little bit of notes, in, uh, some sort of thoughts a bit about very simple structure for your slides. Very few words, very few numbers, very few bullet points, big text. It's there for the audience to read quickly and then listen. It shouldn't really be there as an aid memoir for you as you give your talk, your talk. So, quick reflection back into here. So that was the general stuff. Now, what about thinking about your presentations you're doing today and on Friday? Those who do it on Friday have got a little bit of extra time, so they're kind of a bit lucky. Those of you who are doing it in five minutes or ten minutes, sorry, it's a little bit difficult. You can't change your slides. <laughs> But you might change the way, or might be able to change the way that you actually talk to us. Keep your message simple. You've got 15 minutes, which includes five minutes, hopefully, for uh, questions. So in 10 minutes, you've really got very, very little time to tell us what the interesting thing, why is this project so interesting? Not just to me, the owner of this research, this paper, but all of you there, because there's something in every single person's presentation. Just looking at a list of titles for the whole of the conference. You have something spectacularly interesting about that topic that you should be telling us. Another thing you ought to be telling us here is what is the impact of this research that you're trying to talk to us about? And then try not to forget to tell us what it actually is. You, know, you start off actually in the front with that. But what you've got to do is to plan out in your head what do I want to get over? And for goodness sake, don't include all those statistics, because we couldn't care less, basically. <laughs> now, I'm a computer scientist, analytics, and governance uh, sort of expert, kind of. Now, I want to know about your econo economic research you've been doing in, as a banker in your, for your PhD in Nigeria. I want to know what it is you're trying to do, why it's interesting, why it's important, and what the impact is. I seriously do not want to have 10 minutes of your 50 minute slot on one slide of dense statistics, having you taken me through every single column. Because that really isn't interesting to most people. I mean, there are some people who are interested in statistics and are very, very specialized at it that really do want to work out what the difference between the mean and the CL mean and the 95% and all of those things there. But the general audience here is not that. If you want to do that, do it at an econometrics mo uh, conference, where they really do get into <laughs> statistics. But not here. Oh my God. Not many words. Just plan it out. And then stand here with your few slides. And yeah, you'll press the button occasionally. You'll sort of search for it with your, as you get older. You find it difficult to see until you get close and so on. But yeah. So you then go press the down button, page down, get the next one. And then just talk to us. Tell us your beautiful story, folks. That's what we want, that's what we're here for. And control the audience. You have to grab control, you have to engage with them. You've got to keep eye contact. If you can, during your 10, 15 minutes, see if you can, at the same time, catch every single person's eye in the audience. Watch for those who are nodding your head, because that helps feed you. Helps to feed your enthusiasm and everything else that keeps you going. If you do see people nodding off where you ignore them, because that's going to happen somewhere all the time. But you look for those, there's one guy, a beautiful gentleman over here somewhere, who is really engaged and is nodding and agreeing with me. And that's the person, or one of the people, types of people, you search out for in your audience. <laughs> because they help you to realise, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm doing something right. 
maybe not perfectly right, but you know, I'm contributing something that people actually kind of feel for. And you can't do that if you sort of look at up the top there and just talk to grab your audience. Eye contact. But you've also got to use animation in your voice. One of the things I'm wanting to get round to, perhaps between now and the start of term, is to talk to some of our educationists who run the programme for new academics. And I want to get them to build in kind of a little bit about theatre. Because when you think about it, when we're up on stage, we are acting. We're not Kenneth Branagh, perhaps. But we should understand how to use our voice, how to project our voice. Even if I turn around and look at that, heaven forbid, you should be able to raise your voice so that everybody in the room can still hear. We are performers. <coughs> we are grabbing the audience by the neck and you know, getting them to concentrate on what we are saying, what we are trying to do, what we are telling as our story. And don't stand woodenly like that. Or, you know, you have to stand holding the, po the, you know, the podium thing. I can't do that. I can't use a little sort of presentation with a microphone on there because I can't stand still and keep my vo face right by the microphone. That just doesn't work for me. It shouldn't work for any of us. We should be moving around. We should be using our arms. We should be talking with our arms with everything and with all of our body. That is what we should be doing. Thank you very much, friends. Thank you. Now, as this was set up partly, by the way, as a workshop, and so we're give, offering anybody who would like to have a little private session with me, um, we'll be going up into 212. I think, hopefully, and you can bring along your presentation and we can have a can arrange, say, from about half past ten. Um, well, there'll be an opportunity for you to come and sort of bounce your ideas off me and see what could be done better. See if I've got any ideas for you folks. So that's an option, opportunity. And um, if you'd like to do that, come and see me now and then we'll try and arrange a time and uh, sort of sometime during today. Okay, folks, thank you. All right, thank you. I will show you my demo. Okay. Don't forget. Please, hmm? I want to see you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.